As you know, we are two weeks into May, and so far, it's not a whole lot different from April. Well, except now there's murder hornets. Don't worry, Texas a and has got a task force that's gonna protect us. In any case, we are looking forward to the day that's coming up soon that we'll be able to worship together with you in person. We love you, Lazy Bro. Good morning from the Segovias. We wanted to say we love you and we miss you and we can't wait to worship together. We love you. Well, it's finally happened. You've moved out. You're on your own. Congratulations. But everyone still needs a little help sometimes. Mom, have you seen my wallet? It's in your back pocket. Nah, I checked there. Your other back pocket, dear. Ah, thanks, Mom. Introducing the Mom Personal Assistant, the only smart speaker device with all the wisdom, caring, and sage advice of a mother. Mom, please call Brad. Honey, I'm just not sure he's right for you. Just call him. Okay, calling Ryan. No, Mom, I said call Brad. Trust me. The Mom PA always has your best interests in mind. Wish me luck, Mom. Big interview today. Did you eat breakfast? Uh... Is that what you're wearing? Wait, what? <laughs> Did you even shower? She's there to provide a helping hand whenever you need it. Mom, set a timer for 40 minutes. Mom? The mom personal assistant won't function until you say the magic word. Oh, right. Mom, please set a timer for 40 minutes. Sure thing, hon, but it's only 30 minutes for that dish. The mom PA is always correct and basically knows everything. Mom, what setting should I use for this laundry? Mom, do you think I should color my hair? Hey mom, can you please order mac and cheese? You still have two boxes. What? No, we're out. Did you look? Yeah, I just looked, it's gone. Do you want me to look? Uh, no, no, it's okay. I'll go look again. Try looking with your eyes this time. Based on God's perfect design, the mom personal assistant is thoughtful, kind, encouraging, and supportive. You are beautiful. It's okay. You're gonna get through this. I am so proud of you. You can change the world. But right now, hon, you really need to change your socks because they smell like a dumpster. Ugh, mom. The mom personal assistant. Always helpful, always reliable, and always there for you. Good morning, everyone, and happy Mother's Day. We are so glad that you've joined us this morning. If this is your first time joining us, uh, we'd like to give you a virtual fist bump. And the way we do that is you text in the word fist bump, that's one word, to 97000. That's fist bump, one word, to 97000. Uh, and then we'll get in contact with you and let you know a little bit about our church. We also want to encourage you, if this worship service has been meaningful to you, if these um, worship services over the last few weeks have been meaningful to you, um, why don't you share this worship service? If you're watching or on Facebook or YouTube, just hit the share button, because the chances are if it's been meaningful to you, it'll be meaningful to someone else as well. We also want to hear from you. Um, get in on the comment section. Let us know where you're watching from. Um, we'd love to interact with you during this worship service. It makes it more of a, uh, of a communal event as opposed to just content that you're consuming. So, so don't be afraid to jump in on that comment section. We would really like to hear from you. Now, right now, we are in the middle of a sermon series called God is Greater Than. We've talked about how God is greater than the coronavirus. Last week, we talked about how God is greater than our unrest. And today, we're talking about how God is greater than fear. Um, you know, one thing for children as they are growing up, um, whenever they experience things like fear, whenever they experience things uh, like restlessness, um, one of the most important things for them to know is that they are loved. And, and guess what? That is not just important for children. It is important for all of us, um, which is one of the great blessings of the Christian life, um, is that we know that not only are we loved perfectly, but we are loved perfectly by a perfect God. And so let's dwell on that this morning as we enter into worship. Give his own. 
Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know. If you've joined us for any of our Facebook Lives, then you know that sometimes what we do on those is that we pray the scriptures together. Um, And I'd like us to try a variation on that today. Uh, Today, I'd like for us to pray through Psalm 23. Uh, Psalm 23 is one of the best psalms that we have um, for helping us find comfort in a time of fear or a time of uncertainty. And so here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna read through the passage of scripture And as I'm reading it, you can read along with me or you can just listen and sort of let the words wash over you. Uh, But whatever you do, try and make that that, that scripture a prayer for you this morning. And then I'm going to leave a brief period of silence. And in that silence, you can pray your own prayer or you can listen for what the Holy Spirit may be trying to say to you. And then I'll close this out. So go ahead, and if you have your Bibles, turn to Psalm 23, or like I said, you can just listen. But whatever you do, make this psalm a prayer this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all of the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us to lean on you as our true source of comfort and hope. When we are tempted to look to anything else for our comfort in a time of uncertainty, um, whether it is our jobs, whether it is a relationship, wherever it is that we look for comfort, um, we pray, Lord, that you would call us back to you and, and help us to know 
that you have our best interest in heart. Help us to know that we can depend on you and help us to have faith in you in times like these. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever had a really bad day? I'm talking one of those days where you just sort of do a face palm and you're just like, oh my goodness, could anything else possibly go wrong? I can think of, man, I can think of many, but uh, I remember one time I was driving on the interstate. I forget where I was driving home from. It was raining and the, the regulator that holds my window up broke. So I'm driving down the interstate and my window just comes down. And so I got a free interior wash uh, for my Jeep, thanks to Mother Nature. That was a, a blessing. I remember one time there was a, a clerical mistake at the DMV. Uh, because of that clerical error, my license got suspended without me knowing. Didn't have any tickets or anything, just suspended my license because why not? Uh, and I remember I was uh, driving home one day and a cop pulled, pulled me over to let me know that, hey, your taillight's out, just fix that and you're good. And come to find out, hey, your license is suspended. So that was a, a, a lovely day. I also remember one day our uh, worship band at a church I worked at uh, a while back had just gotten custom molds for in-ear monitors so they could hear the music. And our dog, Darcy, decided that she really wanted to eat those custom molds that cost us a few hundred dollars to get. So we then had to go get them remade, which cost a few hundred more dollars. So uh, I could go on with crazy stories of just days that you're like, oh my gosh, what is going on? And I, I'm sure y'all are sitting there and as I tell these stories, you're like, I've, I've got examples. Yes, yeah, so I've got some days like that as well. And if you do, I would love to just go put those in the comments. That way we can laugh together and be like, <laughs> that's funny. That's a good one. Uh, so go ahead and leave that in the comments. But while you do that, I want to encourage you uh, with a few stories of individuals who might have had an, an even rougher day than you. So I want to show you some pictures because it'll, it'll be a good laugh. Um, there's th this picture of this girl who, who has got, uh, she got two milkshakes, but she was so excited to go drink the milkshakes that she forgot that there, there was a glass window right in front of her. Uh, or this girl who works at Home Depot and forgot to put the top on the paint uh, before she went to mix it. Yeah. There's this guy who, he was looking at a tree that had a big hole in it and he wanted to go see what was in that hole. So he put his face in the hole. And uh, if you guessed that there was a porcupine in the, in the hole, you would be correct. Uh, so there's that one. There's also this guy right here. How many of you ever had this happen where you go to a vending machine, you press the number and you're just waiting for that delectable treat to, to drop so you can consume it and it gets stuck. Am, am I the only one that's had that happen? Go ahead, if that has happened to you, at least give like the, the raising hand emoji in the comments because, oh my goodness, that's so annoying. But this guy here, I, I think it's specifically ironic and poignant that the Snickers bar he's trying to get has the word denied on it. Uh, so that, that's a good one. There's also uh, this individual who is just trying to walk home um, and got drenched with water thanks to the car driving by. There's this driver who, on their way home, drove through a wet spot of concrete and literally got their car stuck in the concrete. Or this individual who, yay, the, the snow plow came through their neighborhood, plowed the snow off the street, but let a, left a little souvenir on the car for them, if you will. And my favorite one of all, uh, <laughs> I, I just I can't imagine this happening, what a frustrating day that would be. Uh, this individual put 1.5 gallons of windshield wiper fluid where the oil in the car is supposed to go. Yeah. And on the screen, you can see the results of that. Pretty hot mess right there. And, and while we, I give you these examples and um, these bad days are rather comical, we, we can laugh and be like, whoa, that's pretty, I mean, that's crazy. That's a bad day, but that's sort of funny. And so while I give you these comical examples, I want to talk to you today about an extremely difficult time in the life of King David. Now, this is before he was the king of Israel, a, a time where David was in serious and severe danger. His very life was at stake, and as a result, he's wrestling with a lot of fear. So I want, I want to walk you through everything that it's going on, that's going on, and then I want to dive into how David deals with the fear that results from this entire situation. 
So if you have your Bibles, please turn to 1 Samuel. We're going to start uh, in chapter 18. So 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 18. And I want to start, actually, if we go back one chapter, that's where David defeats Goliath. And then we look at chapter 18, verse 5. David defeats Goliath. And then 18, verse 5, David marched out with the army and was successful in everything Saul sent him to do. So we see David has defeated Goliath, and so Saul is sending him out on, on more missions, and he's successful, which you would think is a good thing. But what happens a few verses later in verse 7 is the, the, as David came back into the town, town the women of, of the town began to sing, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. So you can imagine Saul might not be that thrilled to hear this. And so there begins to be this, this jealousy and rage that sort of builds up within Saul. And so you go to, to verse, um, verse 10, and it says this. It says, Saul was holding a spear, and he threw it, thinking, I'll pin David to the wall. But David got away from him, not once, but twice. So, so Saul is so jealous and so angry at David because uh, the people love David that he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to kill the guy. And so twice he tries to throw a spear at him and David runs away, but that doesn't work. So you would think maybe Saul would be like, hey, that probably was a bad idea. I should stop. Not the case. We go further down in verse 20. Now Saul's, Saul's daughter, Michal, loved David. And it was, when it was reported to Saul, it pleased him. I'll give her to him, Saul thought. She'll be a trap for him, and the hand of the Philistines will be against him. So what's going on in this passage is uh, Saul's daughter, Michal, loves David. David loves Michal. And so Saul says, here's what I'll do. I'll have them marry one another, but it's sort of the, the bride price. I'll have David go to war against the Philistines, and the Philistines are going to kill David, and that'll fix my problem. And so that's what we see Saul do. Does it work? No, it doesn't work. Uh, Saul, uh, David goes off to battle, but he's not killed. Um, he actually is very victorious, and he marries Michal. And so now David is Saul's son-in-law. And in chapter 19, this is how it starts. Saul ordered his son Jonathan and all his servants to kill David. So, so Saul isn't able to get it done. He tries throwing the spear twice. He th tries setting the trap uh, where maybe the Philistines will kill him. He hasn't been successful. So what does he do? He orders his son and all of his servants to kill David. Now, luckily, uh, his son Jonathan is like, Dad, you know, you have lost your mind. No. And his, his son is able to intervene, and Jonathan um, intervenes and, and saves David. But we go chapter 19, verse 9. Now an evil spirit sent from the Lord came on Saul, and he was sitting in his palace holding a spear. David was playing the lyre, and Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. As the spear struck the wall, David eluded Saul, ran away, and escaped the night. Doesn't this sound familiar? I, I don't know if Saul thought maybe third time is a charm, but this is the third time he's tried to pin David to the wall with a spear. And Is it successful? No, uh, David flees, we see in verse 18. So David fled and escaped and went to Samuel at Ramah and told him everything Saul had done to him. Then he and Samuel left and stayed at Noah. So he goes to Samuel, if you remember, Samuel is the one uh, who anointed David. And, and, and David goes to him and tells him everything that's happened. And so they flee and Saul continues to pursue them. And then chapter 20, David fled from Naoth and Ramah and came to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What did I do wrong? How have I sinned against your father so that he wants to take my life? You see, in the midst of all this, David is rightfully afraid for his life. There's a sense of anxiety and fear that's weighing on David, so much so that we see in verse 3 at the end, it says, As surely as the Lord lives... And as you yourself live, there is but a step between me and death. What David is telling Jonathan is he's convinced that he's going to die. He, he is fearful of his life. And so what happens is, is Jonathan goes, Jonathan goes to, to his dad, to, to Saul, and says, what, what are you doing? What, what, why are you so angry at David? And this is what happens 
in verse 33. Then Saul threw his spear at Jonathan to kill him. So he knew that his father was determined to kill David. So Jonathan goes to Saul and says, why are you trying to do this? And Saul gets so angry, he tries to kill his own son. And so Jonathan goes to David and says, you must flee. You've got to get away. My father's determined to kill you. And in chapter 21, David flees. He goes to Nob. Uh, in, chapter, or in chapter 21, verse 10, David flees uh, to a place called Gath. Uh, and then, it, this is interesting. Gath is actually where Goliath was born. So you know Goliath, the giant that David slays? He goes to his hometown. So imagine... Do you think David is a loved and revered guy in Gath? No. But he's so afraid of what Saul is trying to do to him that he runs to Gath. And he says, it's probably safer to go here than it is to deal with Saul. And so there's a commentator by the name of Derek Kidner. Derek Kidner, he says this, he says, To have fled from Saul to Gath of all places, the hometown of Goliath, took the courage of despair. And so we see that David is in this utter fear, this place of despair. And so he goes to Gath and he's not done there. He continues uh, in chapter 22, David fled Gath and took refuge in the cave of Adullam. And can you imagine the surmounting fear David is feeling? Everything that's going on in his life during this? If we look historically, David was probably about 20 years old. And all the events that I just read from, from chapter 18 on, some scholars disagree, but a lot say it probably happened within a two-year time frame. So within two years, David goes from a, a shepherd and, and nobody, nobody knows who he is. He kills Goliath. He, he's sort of prompted into the spotlight, and he goes from a nobody to target number one by Saul. It reminds me of... Um, a song called Bad Day by Daniel Powder. They used to they used to play it at the end of American Idol, you know, when someone would get, get voted off and uh, this, this song would come in the background and it, it says this, it says, Cause you had a bad day, you're taking one down, you sing a sad song just to turn it around. Y'all know what song I'm talking about? Anybody? If, if you know, give me a thumbs up emoji in the comments, but it reminds me of that song and as you, as you read these passages, you're almost like, man, was that song written for David? Because this is like the worst couple of months, the worst couple of years ever. He's got the king of Israel after him, and the king of Israel has his whole army after David trying to kill him. And so we can understand David is rightfully afraid. So let's think about this. How does David respond to the fear that builds as a result of the situation that he finds himself in? If we look at Psalm chapter 56, verses 1 through 4, Psalm 56 is actually a psalm that David wrote in the midst of all this going on. So in the midst of the fear and the anxiety that he is feeling, these are the words that David writes. He says, Be gracious to me, God, for a man is trampling me. He fights and oppresses me all day long. My adversaries trample me all day, for many arrogantly fight against me. And focus right here on verses 2 through 4. It says this, When I am afraid, I will trust in you. In God, whose word I praise, in God I can trust, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And so in the midst of his fear, David says, God, I can trust in you. And, and I think there's a, a few things we can learn from this passage, three steps, if you will, to, to battle fear that we see David sort of go through in this passage. And I, I want us to, to walk through this because right now, with everything going on in our country, fear is something that I think many of us are wrestling with how, and just afraid of, of everything that's going on. So I want us to look at God's word of how do we battle fear? How do we walk through this? Understanding that David's at a point in his life where he is deeply afraid. As I know in conversations, many of you uh, are battling fear as well right now. So how do we deal with this in a godly way and in a way that draws us to Christ rather than pushes us away from him? So the first thing we see as far as three steps to battle fear is confront your fear. 
in verse two, the first portion of it says, when I am afraid. What's David doing here? He doesn't deny his fear. He says, when I am afraid, God, I am afraid, I admit it. He doesn't deny it, and nor should we. Because if we think about it, how can we deal with something that we deny even exists? How can we deal with the fear in us if we, if we, if we say, oh, no, that's not there. We try to maybe act macho and say, oh, no, I'm, I'm not afraid. I'm, I'm, no, that's not me. We need to admit or confront our fear if we're going to deal with it in a godly way. As we confront it, as we admit our fear, the second thing is surrender your fear. Because what does David say? He says, yes, I have fear, but in the second half of verse 2, I will trust in you. What is David doing here? David gives this fear completely to God. He said, God, yes, I, I, I am fearful, but I will trust in you. Here is my fear. Please take it. There's a commentator by the name of Gerald H. Wilson. Gerald H. Wilson says it this way. He says, in the face of such hot pursuit, the psalmist expresses confidence in God that removes fear. So David, yes, he admits his fear. He admits it, but he also surrenders it to God. And I want to challenge each and every one of you right now that as many of you, you're you're feeling fear. Submit that. Give that to God. And, And give that to God and then fixate on God's promises. So confront our fear, surrender our fears, and then fixate on God's promises. We see in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4, it says this, In God, or this is what David says, he says, In God, whose word I praise, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? And if we look at this passage, where is David focused? What is his focus here? He's fixated on eternity. And he's fixated not just on that, but on the promises of God. That's why he can say, what can mere mortals do to me? What he's not saying is that, you know, uh, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. He's not saying people can't hurt me. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, God, I know you have a plan. I know that you've anointed me to be king. And, And so I trust in that promise that you've made. That that's what you're calling me to do. And so because of that, no, mortal, mortals can't hurt me because my hope is in you. It's not in the things of this world. It's in the promises that you've made. That reminds me of uh, Matthew t- chapter 10, verse 28. It says this, it says, Don't fear those who kill the body but are not able to kill the soul. Rather, fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. There's a, a commentator by the name of Willem A. Gimmerin, and he says this. He says, speaking of what David's going through, he says, fear is there, but he expresses it positively. He neither feeds his fear nor stares at his problems, but looks to his Redeemer who will deliver him. In the midst of this, David is relying on the promises of God. And, and I want to use this as a point of application to ask you, where are your eyes fixated? Are you, are you fixated on your fear? Is that what you constantly worry about day in and day out? You're, you're thinking about your fear and, and you're worried about things. Or are you fixated on the promises of God? Because if we think about it, the promises of God, we see in, in Scripture, Romans chapter 1, God promises salvation to all who believe in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, God promises all things will work together for the good of his children. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, God promises to provide comfort in our trials in the midst of the difficulties that we're going on. God says, I will comfort you. Philippians 1, God promises to finish the work that he started in us. Philippians 4, God promises to give us peace when we come to him and we pray. He says, he'll grant us peace. Matthew chapter 6, God God says that he's going to supply our needs. Not not that we get everything we want, but our needs will be taken care of. Matthew chapter 11, Jesus promises rest for those who trust in him. 
Hebrews 13, Jesus uh, says that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Are we fixated on those promises of God that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to provide for us, that he will give us peace as we come to him in prayer? Are we fixated on those or are we so fixated on our fear that we don't even see the promises of God? So we confront our fears. We surrender our fears to God. And then what we do is we surrender our fears to God and we fixate on God's promises. So I want to ask you, how are you responding to fear right now? Are you responding with anger and worry and and, and having an attitude and just being an emotional roller coaster? Or are you fixated on the promises of God? You know, as we think about it, the past couple weeks we've talked through coronavirus Um, or God is greater than coronavirus. We've talked through God is greater than loneliness, unrest, fear. And real quick, as we wrap up our time together, I want to ask this question. What is the purpose of all these things, of loneliness, unrest, fear? Or not what is the purpose, but how does God use them? And and I want to um, use an illustration. I've got right here, this is my wife's Instant Pot right here. How many of you have one of these? These things are amazing, and my wife makes the best. It's called buttered chicken using this, and I love it. Uh, And now I want to go home and use this to make buttered chicken. But this is an an instant pot, and for those of you that might not know, it's essentially a, it is, it's a pressure cooker. So what it does is it boils water, and and steam builds up, but there's no way for the steam to escape. So the pressure um, and the heat is what cooks the food. Now, similar to this pressure, or pressure cooker, That that pressure is what prepares the food. Similarly, in our life, God uses the trials, the loneliness, the unrest, the fear. It builds sort of this pressure in our life, but it points us and it draws us to him because we realize that we can't handle it all. And we realize that our hope is not in this world, but it's in him. So God uses the adversity or the tough times in our life to bring us to him. Um, Many of you have heard a pastor named Charles Stanley, but he says it this way. He says, adversity is not simply a tool. It is God's most effective tool for the advancement of our spiritual lives. The circumstances and events that we see as setbacks are oftentimes the very thing that launch us into periods of intense spiritual growth. Once we begin to understand this and accept it as a spiritual fact of life, adversity becomes easier to bear. So how does God want want to use loneliness, unrest, or, or fear to help us grow spiritually? He wants those things to draw us to him and to make us more holy, to make us more like him. So... If today you've heard the sermon and and there's something that God has revealed to you as we've been challenged to allow these circumstances in our life to draw us to him, would you just text made my decision to 97000? Again, made my decision, one word, to 97000. I would love to hear how how God has used this in your life to encourage you. Maybe maybe you've been wrestling with fear and you say, you know what, Zach, I need to fixate on the promises of God like David did. But I would love uh, to hear how God has used this in your life. And as we close, I want to real quickly read Psalm chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. This is another psalm that David wrote in the midst of everything going on. This is what David wrote. He says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. So in the midst of David's fear for his life, where does he go? He says, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. For those of you right now that are wrestling a lot of fear with everything going on. Seek the Lord. Allow him to be the one that rescues you from your fear. Allow him to use your fear to develop holiness in you. How great 
the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the night And through the darkness Your loving kindness Tore through the shadows of my soul The work is finished The end is written Jesus Christ, my living hope Who could imagine so great a mercy What heart could fathom such boundless grace The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame The cross has spoken, I am forgiven The King of Kings calls me His own Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever Jesus Christ my living hope Hallelujah Praise the one who set me free Hallelujah Death has lost its grip on me You have broken every chain There's salvation in your name Jesus Christ My living Then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on then came the morning that sealed the promise Your buried body began to breathe Out of the silence the roaring lion Declared the grave has no claim on me And Jesus, yours
Thank you once again for joining us. I just want to remind you of a couple of quick things before we go. Um, first, we have some daily connection times that are available for you uh, where you can connect with a member of our ministerial staff, whether that is through our Facebook Lives or whether that is through our, our weekly Zoom calls on Wednesday. You've got the information for that up on the screen. We, we would really love um, for you to hang out with us during those times. Also, I want to remind you that um, we are uh, still able to accept our tithes and offerings. There are three different ways that you can do that. Um, the information should be on the screen for you right now, but remember that you can text that in, uh, you can mail that in, uh, or you can give online. We've got the info on the screen for you. Um, and, and also, just, just two last things. First of all, uh, remember that uh, mom gets to pick where y'all order out from today. Okay, uh, and I also want to remember, want you to remember that uh, just because this corporate worship service is ending, uh, doesn't mean that this is your last opportunity to worship this week. Um, we can worship wherever we go. We can worship um, in whatever we do. We just have to be intentional about it. Um, Zach read for you uh, from Psalm 34 this morning. Um, and, and there's one other portion of that psalm that I want to leave you with um, as we leave. And it's verse 8. And it says, Taste and see that the Lord is good, and blessed are those who take refuge in him. May the peace of Christ be with you as you go.